past the definite need. Well, the importance of folk art to me is that it was for everybody. It's, um, it was pre-photograph days, so whereas today we take photographs of our children, of our dog, of our house, of our holiday, they would actually have things done in watercolours that were important to them. Beautifully done, but most of it took a lot of patience and a lot of time, which today we don't seem to have much of. Because it's the art of ordinary people and everyday life, the London art world has never had much time for folk art. It may be oil on canvas, but it ain't art. It's much more the concern of the social historian than of any art historian or any curator of a national gallery. The kind of aesthetic lift that you get, or you should get, when you go to the National Gallery or the Tate, has absolutely nothing to do with the giggling amusement that the average viewer would get from pictures of this kind. This is therapy for the lower middle classes. I can't believe that you think they're rather beautiful. I, this, this, this absolute sort of pantomime car with its ridiculous little other, it requires absolutely no drawing at all. He requires no drawing. I, you see how the poor man has no neck. His head is sunk into his shoulders. That's, that's child stuff. I see nothing witty about that. I see only primitive incompetence. I see the same kind of incompetence in the car as I do in the man, and the landscape, and the windmill, and the sky. It's infertile ground. What we have in looking at it from today's standpoint is a wonderfully uninhibited charm, the use of bright color, um, the sort of symbolic value of the things represented as opposed to the, the simply the observation of these things. They have a power which is beyond reality. We're dealing with works here which are so straight from the shoulder, so direct, that the word aesthetic seems almost pompous, inappropriate. Rather as we can't talk about these pictures as paintings because they're not necessarily made of paint. They were made of whatever the artist had to hand, wool, shells, sand, even human hair. The range of the Kalman collection is very, very wide. We have embroidered paintings, we have street scenes, animals, sporting pictures, and we have, of course, three-dimensional objects like this pig, pottery shop, and also hanging signs, street signs, an incredible collection. It bears as much relation to the the art of, of, of Leonardo and Raphael, or if you must put it in the English context, um, Gainsborough and Reynolds, as, as the poetry of Pan Air's bears to Tennyson and Shelley and Byron. But people love Pan Air's poetry, and they love folk art. Since 1987, Andres Kalman's private collection of over a hundred paintings and objects has been on exhibition to the public either in the Museum of Naive Art in Bath or here in London at the Crane Kalman Gallery. Now the future of the collection is in doubt. My father's collection is culturally very important. Uh, it's the only one of its kind in this country. And it, it reflects and uh, gives a, a pictorial reference of much of what happened in 19th century Great Britain. There is a, a, a snobbery involved, certainly, um, although folk art uh, crosses all boundaries in terms of class boundaries, for example, because it features in pictures uh, lifestyles of, uh, from boxers and rat catchers to uh, lords of the manor. And it is a shame that this art uh, intelligentsia have often ignored, ignored it, and uh, very few pictures are uh, featured in, in public collections in this country. It's a pity that museums didn't start acquiring folk art 20 years ago when you could pick up excellent examples for virtually nothing in any antique shop. That was before shrewd dealers realized there was a killing to be made. I'm a dealer, so I'm out and I'm buying and I'm elevating prices. I can get up to three to four thousand pounds for a good primitive painting. For a wonderful primitive painting, I could get ten thousand pounds. But I can still, I can, and so can anybody else, still go into a junk shop and buy a painting for £10, £15, £20. I did it the other day on a small painting. I found a small painting in a book, and I gave £10 for it. 
So we can all go out and buy wonderful things cheaply. Unfortunately, if they get into my hands, I elevate the price and they become expensive. To give you an idea about prices, this is a painting that I bought a few weeks ago from another dealer for £325. If I was going to resell it, I could easily get five or six hundred for it. But if it went to a specialist shop in London, it wouldn't surprise me if they asked about fifteen hundred for it. The finest examples of English folk art end up in America, where folk art has always been highly appreciated and where English prices seem like bargains. In the United States, of course, there's a huge enthusiasm for this whole field. And indeed, I'm in the throes of organizing an exhibition on 200 years of English naive painting, 1700 to 1900, which will tour the United States in about 1995, but will, paradoxically, not be shown in this country. Uh, again, it's a lost opportunity. It would be simple to show a ready packaged exhibition here, but it's not going to happen. Nothing could be more British, more part of our heritage, than this unique collection which records the rural values of a vanished way of life. Yet its future hangs in the balance. It could disappear abroad or be dispersed at auction tomorrow. Few members of the so-called art establishment who raise havoc at the export of an obscure Italian sculpture will lift a finger to save such an obviously important social document let alone an enormous source of pleasure for future generations. Why? I wouldn't in the least mind if this collection disappeared to America. It seems to me that it is perfectly fitting that the Americans should see what their roots are in their own country. And why shouldn't the British see what their roots are in their own country? Because I don't believe that this is root at all. I believe that this, this is a kind of primitive subtext to, to, to art that has run for centuries. It, it works for what it is, but what it is is not worth tuppence. Though I've no doubt it costs many thousands of pounds. But aesthetically, it's worth nothing. It's not possible to repeat a collection of that quality again. Too much has ebbed away from these shores. Too much has crossed the Atlantic to America. If that collection isn't kept in this country, we've lost a vital part of our inheritance. Unlike a constable, a John Constable landscape, if that goes to the United States, it may have changed its address, but it remains British. If one of those anonymous Kalman pictures goes to the United States, the chances are it will become American. People are beginning to realize we're here. We set up lots of workshops and concerts. And I think it would be a tragedy if the paintings were A, to be split up, but even more tragic if they were sent abroad. They are so English, and I think they really should stay in England, and I think something really should be done to save them. Before we go on looking at some of Diana's favourite watercolours, Let's take a look at how British street fashion has become a collector's pride and joy. Malcolm McLaren reports. Wake up, you lot in there. Watch this. And you might learn something. whole attitude that became known as punk rock and the attitude in that shop was was all about thinking you could get away with anything I'd go to a guy and I'd ask him to create a little wood block you know like something out of a John Paul printing outfit and here you dip this in ink this little wood block and I'd literally just <laughs> press it onto the t-shirt and that would be it. That would be the printed T-shirt. So everything had this very hand, arts and craftsy um, element to it that made them all, in particular, one-offs. And the kids on the street began to create their own. Their own inspired directly from the shop set. Some bought it. Some just imitated it. Some tried to steal it. Uh, some particularly, I'll never forget, bought those clothes without the objective, object of wearing them at all, but merely to collect. It was very intimidating to go to the shop 
uh, unless you were kind of part of, of that happening. No other shop produced a magazine like that. It's very different from Benetton. I felt even then when I was buying the clothes that I was buying artistic statements. Bondage clothes are pretty recognisable and pretty collectible. Um, Let It Rock t-shirts, very, very collectible. You can't find this stuff. You know, this stuff, there wasn't a lot made. I know, I made it with my bare hand. There was maybe 30 t-shirts of this, 20 of that, 10 of that. Out of those, probably 75% were destroyed. So what do you got left? Maybe five, if you're lucky. Of course they are going to forever grow in value. I think that the clothes that uh, museums are going to be wanting and collectors in the future are those specifically made by Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren. Um, because these are the two people who are credited with all the innovation, the ideas behind the punk movement, the groups, the clothes, everything. And they are, if you like, um, the haute couture of punk costume. The traditional use of materials in the making of t-shirts never was something that I endeared myself to because you're always looking for the alternative. You're always looking for the, the thing that not necessarily would shock, but the thing that would make everything that you did unique. And I decided to go across the road to this Hungarian restaurant and ask the guy in there to keep all the chicken bones. And with these piles of bones, I would find a way with Vivian to um, pierce the ends of them. And um, with some glue, stuck with a few lengths of chain to knit them into a slogan, a word. I did um, two, I think, one called sex, in written in bone, and one called rock. It's a t-shirt that's been hacked about, had inserts put in where the sleeves were, um, studded with chains, drilled chicken bones to spell the word rock, First of all, I'd want to make sure it was labelled, which it is. It's got the Let It Rock label, which is around 1975. I'd also look for alterations, so I'd look inside, because any alteration affects the value. Oh dear, we've got a hole there. I'm not sure it's an original one. Oh yes, perhaps it is. It's an amazing idea. It's a really beautiful T-shirt, and it, it's probably the main item that people would want. It's an exceptional piece of punk costume because it's, it's a one-off item, I believe, made by the actual hand of Malcolm McLaren. Um, it's an unrepeatable item. This T-shirt, according to the T-shirt book, is, is priceless. I would be interested to see what prices actually meant at auction. I would love to submit this and put it in a sale and see what exactly priceless means to somebody. If they mean 100 thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. I would love to see that. My feeling is a sensible limit at the moment would be around a thousand, but I, I'd be willing to be shocked. I think they have a value to me of probably, if I was to die tomorrow, there may be a million interviews, but if you had to touch something that I did, that was about all. Now, when I look back on them, my only uh, moment as a painter in the traditional sense as much as I could say I am. I don't see them as museum pieces personally because I'll still wear mine and the piece that's probably rarest of the things I have I will wear a lot and have worn a lot. That love and the conservation um, it's um on the one hand, I want to, you know, preserve them in tissue, acid-free tissue, please, as, as the V&A do. And on, you know, on the other extreme, I want people to wear them. The Victoria Albert Museum suddenly wake up and think, well, we'd better collect some of these clothes. And they suddenly did. And um, to some extent, they kind of collect them rather late in the day because they don't have the best. The best, I'm afraid, are in private hands and 
more often than not in places like France, Japan, and uh, New York. We know that it was more important than we think in the music terms, but you know, I, I think, you know, I think clothes-wise, it was it was so important. Everything, in, everything that I suppose pop culture has meant to me is in one. those t-shirts. I don't have anything, sadly. Joanna, this looks like a British Railways advertising place to one of their few trays of milk. I think it's absolutely sublime. It's by John Sell Cotman, one of the greatest masters. And although it was painted so long ago, it's got an incredibly vivid, present-day feeling about it. I love the way the colours are sort of locked in and quite soft, the shadows under that, the great bulk, the weight of that enormous structure, reflected in these lovely watery bits there. He's effortless, masterly. He, this is a master. You've got to love it. You love it. Yes, I do, actually. Yes, I do. I think it's absolutely superb. But why does it, Huon, why does it look so modern? Well, it's totally simple. He's used very few colours. He's used geometry, really, a bit of triangle and the curves. It's all very simple blocks of colour and, and um, structure and he's he this sort of style had great influence in the 1930s so railway oh, posters is very, that's why it looks like uh, a railway very opposite yeah. exactly yes i think if i couldn't buy that i'd steal it hmm. <laughs> joanna's choice of watercolors would cost hundreds of thousands of pounds even if they were for sale round the corner from the royal academy there's a watercolor dealers fair at the park lane hotel after the break, we've invited London's most distinguished watercolour dealer, Jeremy Moss, to show us his selection of the works on sale. Maybe we'll even find something for Joanna there. <laughs> Welcome back. Joanna Lumley's enthusiasm for English watercolours is very infectious. If you share it, don't forget the watercolour fair which starts tomorrow. I'm joined by Jeremy Mars, the chairman of the fair. Now, Jeremy, while Joanna's waxing lyrical around the rest of the Royal Academy exhibition, I want you to give us some very practical advice. What could I, or Joanna, or any of our viewers possibly hope to be able to buy in the field of watercolours today? Well, let, let's start with the, the biggest fair, shall we? It's by Henry Stacey Marks, and it's, of course, Storks. It's very decorative. It's magnificent. It's got it? great presents. What sort of price would that be? It's two thousand pounds. Two thousand pounds. Yes. Now, what's that peeping underneath there? Now, this is by Albert Goodwin, and it's of Exeter. Um, Exeter Cathedral. Exeter is that? Cathedral in the yes. distance. How much is that now? This is um, two thousand pounds. Oh, again. That is expensive. Yes. Now, why again am I paying two thousand pounds for that? Are all English watercolours two thousand pounds? No, they're not by any means. There are um, some which are cheaper. We'll come to those in a moment. Right. Tell me about these two here. Do they rather look like engravings? Are you sure they're watercolours? Uh, I'm sure they're watercolours, but um, they're by Robert Dighton, um, who was a, a contemporary of Rosenson, really. Um, and they're 750 each. 750 yes, each? Well, we're yes. getting slightly cheaper. Uh, no, I think I've got it wrong. It's 950 each. 950 each. 950 each. So we're once again stuck with 2,000 pounds. Practically, yes, that's yes, 1,500 pounds. Uh, yes, but that's... Well, now, not, there's a rather melancholic-looking animal over there. Looking very sorry for himself. Well, it's um, an elephant seal. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's feeling sorry for himself. It's a perfectly normal look for him. <laughs> um, it's by Keith Henderson. Um, and he was an illustrator. It's really rather, rather splendid, isn't it? I absolutely adore it. Now, how much would I have to pay for that? That's 1,200, 1,200. Mm. Well, we're getting closer to getting the price range. Way. Now, there's something tucked under here. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. Aha! Uh -huh. um, now, this is by George Howard, 9th Earl of Carlisle, and it's of Lake Garda. 
in Italy, and it was done in 1866. Now, how much would I have to pay for that? Well, I'll say that if, if, you, if this was done by another artist of the, of the same period, who's better known, you can add a naught to what I'm going to tell you now. So I'm waiting. It's 475, really. And finally, I must say, that's quite a hot tip. Yes. I quite like that. Ah, now that, I must admit, is absolutely ravishing. Well, this is by uh, Thomas Cromack. And um, most unusually, it's a very intimate view of his studio for him. It's not an architectural subject. I must say, I think we might have found something that Joanna would rather like. How much would you charge her for it? Uh, it's £2,000, I think. Another £2,000. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jeremy, for that insider advice. Before Joanna joins us for her final choice, have you ever wondered what happens to all that stuff in your builder's skip? <laughs> Our obsession with turning the semi into something out of Brideshead Revisited is as strong as ever. But where does all this stuff come from? The answer is demolition salvage. The passion for collecting period architectural fixtures and fittings for reuse is now worth big money. But it wasn't always like this. In the 1950s and 60s, the fashion for a contemporary G-plan way of life meant that when old buildings were demolished, their contents were simply burnt. But one small boy was beavering away, salvaging architectural fragments that no one else cared about. Charles Brooking collects everything with knobs on. He has hundreds of door and room fittings, sash pulleys and locks, alongside complete windows, period doors, and thousands of pieces of skirting, dado, and architrave. It adds up to 30,000 pieces of our architectural heritage saved from the builder's bonfire. My interest started in an unusual way. It was really a passion for all kinds of shape and design. Hard to explain exactly when it started, but I can't remember it not being there. Um, on walks with Nanny down the road, I noticed um, various designs of Bakelite numerals on gateposts, and I started building up a collection of these. And my parents and other people thought this was most unusual. I was taken to child psychologists. No one understood why I wasn't interested in toys. Shapes dominated my life. They said a great deal to me from all points of view. I noticed the elegant sliding sash windows in many Victorian houses. Their sash horns and meeting rails. And immediately wanted sections of those, first of all sections. And my father agreed, after some badgering, to take me around demolition sites and recover bits, just wooden sections of these windows. I started visiting sites on my own in about 1970, going around asking the workmen if I could look around and giving them a drink for requiring things. Well, I went on the site, and my mother had done this in the past. I learned from her and asked for the foreman. And he'd say, yeah, what do you want? I'd like to look at your sash windows and bits and pieces. Can't come on the site, insurance problems. We can't have you walking on the, the site. is dangerous, mate. I said, well, look, um, I only want a quick look at the pulleys. I'll give you a drink, a packet of cigarettes or something like that. Won't take long, because there weren't hard hats then. And I'd shoot in and, of course, spend about an hour looking around and come out with a haul of stuff. I got my first display shed for my 15th birthday in the autumn of 1968. I moved the collection out of the bedroom at long last and specialised more. Um, setting it up, I suppose it was up and running by late 68. And people used to come and see it. Charles Brooking has financed his collection entirely from his own very limited means and continues to do so. Its archival value must be well over half a million pounds. Now the University of Greenwich in South London has taken on the responsibility of displaying it as a vital reference collection for the history of architecture. It's really important, I suppose, because it's the information it contains, information that's absolutely essential for anyone who wants to repair an old building. One can understand the building more clearly by going to Charles's collection. He will explain the dates of shutters and um, glazing bars, when they change form, uh, pulleys and windows, you can date your window. So it's a fantastic repository of information. He explains exactly what it is, where it comes from, the provenance is important, what date it is, and he will tell you to what degree it's typical of that period. This is a lead rainwater head from Botanic House, Finsbury Circus, designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens between 1924 and 1928. I rescued it about five years ago when the building was refurbished. This is unrestored. Um, it's a balustrade or handrail section with new posts from a 99 Gloucester place um, off Baker Street, London, built about 1810. 
Um, I risk of this about 1979 when the building's refurbished. <laughs> But these days, architectural salvage is valuable for more than just information. Charles has to compete against a new breed of scavenger for whom demolition sites provide rich picking. Everything from the floorboards and the plumbing to the most sought after, finely carved details is spiraling in price. Salvage has become a tremendously big business. Usually, the stuff goes via the big wholesale architectural salvage companies, and not to say they're bent or anything, but the guy comes with an item, you know, they want it. They don't, it doesn't know, they don't know where it's from, and they believe his maybe stupid story that it, you know, found it or in his garage or something, they buy it. And there's a big public demand. And, and if you go around um, an architectural warehouse, salvage place, you can just look at the prices, and, you know, the prices reflect, they're high, reflecting the fact that, you know, people out there are willing to pay a lot. The salvage business doesn't just stop there. Here in this old military barracks, a company called 38 Antiques doesn't just stockpile architectural fragments, they transform them. What we do is we take old bits and pieces that have, have, have come out of demolished houses. They're floorboards, joisting, um, architraves, skirting boards, picture rails, dado rails, old bits of panelling, shutters, door linings, anything really. We strip it, we preserve the old patina on the wood, and then we put it together and make new furniture out of it. Really, it's the ultimate recycling. We're taking stuff that people don't want anymore, that would just be thrown away or burnt, and we're making useful, good quality, good looking pieces of furniture out of it. Most of 38 antiques pieces are destined for hotel chains and interior decorators in America. Prices range from hundreds of pounds for a simple piece to tens of thousands for a whole room. Could clients be misled into thinking furniture that looks old really is? The danger is someone might be somewhere down the line. The thing is, this stuff is, generally speaking, there's no relationship to anything made in the past. It's just a kind of, I say, a sort of naff interpretation of 18th and 19th century buildings. Uh, um, furniture, and therefore, I suppose, creating tremendous confusion in the minds of the, of the public and the purchaser, you know, what's real and what's not. There's a great deal of snobbery in the antiques world, and really, it, 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 needs, it needs a little bit more tolerance. We're not pretending to be antique dealers. We tell people exactly what they are getting from us. But perhaps it's as well to find out exactly how and what Simon's furniture is made from. For love or money, took Charles Brooking to Simon's showroom to show him how an intrepid entrepreneur dealt with the architectural fragments that Charles was unable to save. So you've seen them putting the bits and bobs together. You've seen where we store them. This has now been polished and is ready to go out the door. Right. This, I take it, is early 19th century tour skirting. You've cut it down. And this looks like a late Georgian internal six-panel door. That's right. Yeah, we've just cut that straight down the middle and straight across the waist and it gives you the four doors for the press. This looks about 1810, this door, and that's where the lock would have been, the mortise lock. Keyhole discussion. Yeah, it's very lock. sharp for you to pick that up, actually. And the columns themselves. Columns are cut out of joist. These, I mean, they look as if they could be early 19th century, but hard to tell. Uh, no, actually, it's reproduction. They're wonderful quality. We buy them out of France. It's just not available in this country. It's actually a television cupboard. Oh, right. So you can get your TV in there, your video recorder, your satellite equipment. Endless quantities of videotapes, obviously, because yes. it's really quite a cavernous hole. So these top doors slide back in so that you can watch it from wherever you are in the room. What's the demand for these? Um, we can't actually make enough of this particular style of furniture. Obviously, every piece is a bit different because we don't have two doors exactly the same. But generally, every one of these we can make, we sell. See. Whether fresh from the building site or turned into TV cabinets, the longing for that traditional look means period fittings are more sought after than ever before. While Simon Saunders' furniture wends its profitable way to America, Charles Brooking struggles on to save and document our architectural heritage. Not for money, but for love.
And now for this week's Moment of Truth. For Lummel Money is going to watch Joanna Lumley make her choice of her favourite watercolour from the watercolours that Jeremy's just been showing us. Over to you, Joanna. Yes, well, I've been having a really difficult time, and I've finally managed to whittle it down to these last two here. This is a gorgeous interior, a sort of gentleman's room where he's thrown his coat and his hat and his shoes. But I think I have, in fact, finally chosen this very outside feeling, a gorgeous, fresh lakeside, what looks like an Italian lake, Jeremy. Yes, it's Lake Garda. Um, it's agonizing making a choice like this, because yes. um, to me, they're equally good in their way, but yes. quite different. Can I afford this, do you think? I think you probably could. What um, do you think it is, about price-wise? I, I can tell you exactly. It's yes. £475. Now, that doesn't seem a, little, a lot of money. It's actually not a lot of money at all, is it? I think it's an absolute snip. So that's Joanna's hot tip for the watercolours fair. The view from the Lake of Garda by George Howard, 9th Earl of Carlisle. The fair starts tomorrow at the Park Lane Hotel from 11 o'clock. It goes on till Sunday. But do pop into the Royal Academy first, if only to get your eye in. That's all for this week. We'll be back next week at the same time. Until then, from Joanna and me, goodbye. Next week, for Love or Money, goes fishing with Jeremy Paxman. Investigates the new craze for studio pottery and meets the chocolate king of East German art. Thank you.